Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna talk about Atmos, um, really height channels, uh, surround channels a bit, and the, the overall concept. So many of you watching my video already know this. For those who don't, we'll just do a quick recap. One of the things that differentiated Atmos from its predecessor of uh, Dolby Digital Plus or Dolby True HD, um, so when we went from the classic Dolby Digital to Dolby True HD and Dolby Digital Plus, the biggest thing that changed was all of a sudden we had the ability to have seven discrete channels, which were basically full bandwidth, and then a partial bandwidth subwoofer channel. And actually, I believe the channel itself is full bandwidth. It's just it was used for bass, so it's the effect channel, bass effect channel. And um, Atmos switched things around by fundamentally changing what it means to be a channel in that at the mixing phase of things, you can actually assign objects basically as a moving path which then has metadata assigned with it that gives your processor essentially like xyz information on the object path the xyz information then allows the processor to make its own decisions on what speakers that should go to based on your speaker layout at least in theory if everything has been done right and they've used the objects appropriately you could have a significant number of channels the limit for home home theater home dolby atmos is 34 rendered channels um, so you could, in theory, use all of those, and it, nobody has to, they don't have to mix the uh, system to work on 34 channels. It does that because the processor recognizes the path based on those changing XYZ coordinates and just figures out which speakers it needs to assign that sound to at what level, at what point in time, and gives you a more immersive experience. So hence Dolby Atmos, object-based audio. It's a different approach. It doesn't always work that way. There's things that can be done for economic reasons mostly that limits the use of these dynamic objects and ultimately renders it more of like a fixed channel-based system. And so sometimes you can have a system that's got extra sets of wides, uh, I'm sorry, wides, extra sets of side surrounds, maybe like eight tops, things like that. And it's actually only using two tops and it doesn't use any of the extra speakers and it's sort of fixed at 5.1 or 7.1. That happens, it's not great. Um, I used to tell people that that can't be right, and then it turned out it was. And a friend of mine who actually is a, a sound producer in the industry who does this had looked into what was going on and found out for me. And it basically it is what it is. Nothing we can do about it. They don't always follow the best practices. A lot of big production films that were done correctly, and they do have the objects the way they should. So let's get back to what you should expect. As I said, Going back two generations, we already had gotten to a point where surround channels were full range. Atmos is full range for all channels. So, so a lot of people have this idea that like you don't need good wides, you don't need good side surrounds, you don't need good top, for sure you don't need good tops, it's just for atmospheric effects. A lot of people that mix this stuff in the industry get very upset about that because it's not, that's not true and it's not how they use those channels. So remember that Gravity was one of the first films to come out in Dolby Atmos. And it was, it used, so it had a voice basically in the overhead speakers. It wasn't just atmospherics, it was somebody talking. It took advantage of the full bandwidth of that channel. So think about it. If somebody's voice is supposed to go from a side or in front of you to overhead, for that to sound totally natural as if that person actually did that, there needs to be really good timbre matching between the tops and the other speakers. Those shouldn't be just crappy in-ceiling speakers that just don't sound like the rest. You actually have to make sure that they are consistent. So spending money on the tops is not a waste of money. It's a good idea. It's part of getting the most out of Atmos. Many people who argue otherwise are arguing that out of ignorance, not out of knowledge of the, of the facts or truth of this. And the ignorance comes from, and I'm not saying they're ignorant people, I'm saying ignorance as in lack of knowledge about what would have happened had they done it the right way. Point being that people put up in-ceiling speakers they hear it, it sounds good, and so they say, see, that's all you need to do. What's not realized is, had that been a proper timbre match speaker to the rest of your speakers, you would have heard everything the way you were supposed to with much better balance. It would have been a much more coherent pan towards the ceiling. The same thing is true of the side surrounds. In fact, it's more important. If you have to compromise the tops, like if you have to compromise something, I'd compromise the tops before I would compromise the side surrounds. So really what you do want is all matching brands and line of speakers. And that's assuming that the manufacturer has done a very good job timbre matching all the speakers. They don't always do that. 
Now, one thing I'll say is a speaker can have a frequency response that's significantly different enough to not timbre match in and of itself, but that is fixable. What you can't fix is the part of that timbre is in a room happens from reflections. And so if the speaker's directivity is dramatically different from that of the other speakers, then that can cause some problems that can make timbre matching very difficult. The ceiling reflections do not play as big a role in our perception of timbre as the walls do. And so the horizontal response of the speaker tends to be a bit more important in that regard than the vertical. But the vertical is not completely unimportant. Now in my system, I actually, my last system contained Earl Getty's speakers, the Gedley Abbeys, which is, was, was a 12 inch two way waveguide speaker using his tech. It's a very good speaker, but I only had three of them. And instead of doing like a really nice timbre matched set of speakers for the rest, I just built some good enough surrounds and I made sure they had a nice flat response and I EQ'd everything after it was all put together so that the responses overlaid pretty well with each other across all the speakers. I used Direct Live at one point with the system and things like that. It always sounded good. I liked it. I had heard fully timbre match systems, but my system did so many things well. I wasn't, I guess I wasn't sure at that time. This was years ago, many years ago now, before I was even working in the industry. Um, I wasn't really sure what it would take to get, like what, what would I gain, I guess, by going to a fully timbre match system. I kind of questioned how important that was. Uh, then I built this system. And again, I have heard, because I professionally built these things, I've heard plenty of match systems. They almost always sounded better than my own system because I just didn't have the money. And that's what I looked at it as. I don't have the money to do what I'm doing for clients, so that's why it doesn't sound as good. And then I built my system, which admittedly is not cheap, and I spent money, and there is something to be said for that. But the effect of the timbre matching was huge. It was very obvious that everything improved in terms of the coherence and consistency of those pans, how well they you know, sound objects would go from speaker to speaker and sound like it was just moving along the room. Even before the treatments went up, it was clear how important it was. Once the treatments went up, all the better. Um, so the speakers played a really big role and really reinforced to me just how critical that is. That isn't something that should be uh, an oversight. So I'm going to start with that idea. Remember, full range channels, you should have good speakers. Doesn't mean they need to be full range, but they should be 80 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is the basic requirement when you're using bass management. And they should be good at it. They should have the same kind of dispersion, generally speaking, and the same kind of overall response shape as the LCRs. It shouldn't be like best money can buy LCRs, junk everywhere else. That's not a good idea. Okay, now back to the Atmos speakers. One of the most common things that's been going on for years is people like to turn the center channel up and the surrounds up. And the newest one with Atmos is to keep turning the tops up. We balance these so that everything is consistent so that the SPL levels are the same when you send a certain signal level, like a minus 20 dBU signal to each speaker, that the SPL at the microphone is exactly the same down to about a dB or so from every speaker in the system. And we ideally, we want that to be true at every seat. It won't be, but you, that would be the ideal. And if you do the system right, you can get pretty close to that. But a lot of people will hear that and they'll say, I don't know, I don't hear the Atmos speakers. I don't hear those tops. Turn them up. And, you know, and we'll argue, no, no, it's correct. This is the way it's supposed to sound. Well, I, I can't hear it. And then of course we leave and then they go and turn it up 6 dB or something. It's not the right way to do it. And if you've turned your tops up so that they are in fact louder than the rest, more than likely what you're doing is trying to do one of two things. Either overcome a problem that has nothing to do with the level of the speakers and is more to do with the quality and match of the speakers, or your expectations are inaccurate. So basically what you're thinking you're supposed to hear isn't what you're actually supposed to hear, which is reasonable. It's hard to know. We don't have a point of reference. There's no way for somebody to say to you, this is what it sounds like. Is that what you're hearing? Basically, if you get everything matched the way I've told you, the sound engineers that, that do the movie soundtrack in the first place will get the rest right. So you don't need to goose it. You're, what you're doing is changing the director's intent when you do that. If you're goosing it because you can't hear it, it means your expectation is that those effects that are overhead are much louder and call more attention to themselves than they're actually supposed to. And that's a really common issue is that people are expecting to hear them in a much more obvious way than they do. It shouldn't call that, you shouldn't be like able to like look up and be like, oh my gosh, I hear it coming from the ceiling. It shouldn't be that obvious. And if that's happening, you've probably got the level too loud. The same thing with the side surrounds. A lot of times people feel like it should be much louder than it is. They're expecting more. Remember, a lot of the action in a movie is happening in front of you. It's, they, they build the soundtrack around the fact that we can't look around like this when we're watching a movie and see everything. 
So they have to keep everything in front of you. That turning that you're doing, the camera's doing instead, and you're staying focused straight ahead. So always what's happening to your sides behind and above you is what would be happening outside of your periphery anyway. And that's how they mix the soundtrack. So the point of this video really is just to, to kind of remind people that the intent is not for everything to call attention to itself. You shouldn't be turning those levels up above what's really the right levels. Your expectations are that actually the engineers, the sound engineers and the director, they've already figured out what those levels are supposed to be. They've already figured out how it's supposed to sound to them. The systems they're mastering on are perfectly balanced. And so you want your system to also be perfectly balanced. And then that way everything will be correct. If the effects are not loud enough, it's probably just the way the soundtrack was done and it was done on purpose. So I hope this was helpful. And uh, again, subscribe to my channel, comment below, and uh, we'll keep these videos coming. Thanks.